Hello, my name is Tez Ilyas and welcome to episode one, the very first episode of my YouTube interview series, Legacy. Now I'm Tez Ilyas, I'm a stand-up comedian, actor, uncle, slacktivist, which means I care about things but don't do anything about them. This is my YouTube channel, subscribe to it. We'll have a brand new interview with you every single week. I interview other comedians, actors, authors, athletes, just interesting people who are making an impact on the world today. Now the reason I've called it Legacy is because I wanna find out from my interviewees what they would like their legacy to be once they're no longer with us. It's an interesting question. I'm sure we've all wondered it about ourselves. What would we like to be remembered for? Now personally, I've thought about it a lot and what I'd like to be remembered for is... I can, I can do a really good foot slide. Like my moonwalk probably needs a bit of work, but I can do a, I can do a decent foot slide actually. And if you want to see it, you can watch my special, which is on this channel. Subscribe, all that stuff. It's called Testify, and I do a foot slide in that. A foot slide is like a sideways moonwalk. So that's what I'd like to be remembered for. Anyway, on episode one, very first episode, debut episode, I'm really, really excited about my first guest. His name is Adam Rowe. He's a scouser. He's an amazing comedian and a very good friend of mine. And and Aaron is a very ambitious man and he's got a lot that he wants to say about this subject. So without further ado, please welcome Adam Rowe! Adam Rowe in the house, let's go! I'm just gonna move this up a little bit so people can see my face. What's up Adam, how's it going? I'm good lad, how are you? I'm really good, thank you. Shut this door. Okay, you do that mate. Um, that is Ed Adam Rowe from his house in Liverpool, I believe. Yeah, and not a fucking jail cell as the brick wall behind us makes it look like. <laughs> um, what is that deco? What room are you in your, in your house? What room has that deco in your house? So this is currently my office slash studio, whatever. Um, mm. And I put those... I, I When we were moving in, I asked Jade, could I get like a brick wall wallpaper for like the backdrop of videos and stuff? And she eventually let me get that one because she was like, I didn't mind the purple. You just can't have like... a. I don't want like a red brick wall. It'll look tacky and whatever. But now the reason like I, I, I could show you around this room. It's a joke. We're, we're swapping this with our bedroom. So the bedroom becomes the office and this room becomes the bedroom because the sun rises and shines into my bedroom. So as of about 8am at the minute, my bedroom's like a fucking oven. Oh, mate. You, so we're just, it, it's too much. We're literally redecorating our whole house because I don't like being woken before 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the same thing. Um, In my bedroom, the sun shines on that side of the house, but I kind of just, I just sleep through it, man. I can't, once I'm out, I'm out. Like there's there's no waking me up. So um, I'm not, I, it takes me a while to get to sleep, but once I'm gone, mate, I am, I'm, I'm like, I'm out for the count. Yeah. I'm exactly the same, apart from with heat. If I get too hot, I'm awake. Like, right, okay, you could enough. build a conservatory in my bedroom and the noise won't wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> and it drives Jade mad because if someone's knocking at our door and we've got a little dog, it'll probably interrupt us at some point. Um, and she, if anyone's near our house, she's such a little barky, tiny Jack Russell-esque dog. She can be screaming in my ear if I'm asleep. Right. Like the, the postman's at the fucking door. And I'm just like, nah, I, I'm, I'm out. So it does one thing that wakes me up and it's heat. And it, it, I can't be hot in bed, even of a night. Until I met Jade, right? If it was up to me, in winter, it could be snowing outside and I'd sleep with the window open. That's too... I once dated a girl who insisted on keeping the window open uh, when we when, when went to bed and stuff. And I couldn't, hand, I couldn't handle it. I think that's part of the reason why it never lasted because it'd be, like you said, it'd be Arctic conditions and she'd want to crack the window open. I'm like, that's, it's, that's not how people live. So I should have set you two up. Like, that would have been, you'd have been perfect <laughs> for each other. Yeah, you can have Jade. I'll go with her and it sounds... <laughs> I don't think Jade wants me, mate. Oh, mate, I've got to be honest with you at the minute. She'd be up for accepting a trade. <laughs> um, That'd be good. Um, yeah, while the you can warm yourself open. up though. You can't cool yourself down. It's very difficult to cool yourself down. If you wrap in a quilt, it doesn't matter what's going on outside. You can always get warmer. Yeah, and I guess body heat as well. Yeah, exactly. All of that. Um, so listen, for those who don't know, this is my good friend Adam Rowe. He's a hilarious stand-up comedian coming from Liverpool. And I've, I've seen a couple of questions saying Everton Liverpool. Do you want to answer that? 
<laughs> that should do it, shouldn't it? Yeah, that uh, should do it. That should let you know who he supports. He's uh, uh, the champions elect. Yeah, elect well, being the fucking annoying term. We're the champions of the world still, and Europe. Because until although we've been knocked out of Europe, until there's a new champion, yeah, we're still yeah. champions. Yeah, so you could do that for another. Yeah, if they don't, if they don't sort that out yeah. in by August, then you'd be European champions for two years in a row. That's why I'm campaigning, and I feel very strongly about this. The Champions League should be scrapped because there's lives at risk, and the Premier League should be brought back for the sake of the nation's morale. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's so funny? I'm like the other way around. I'm like for for a laugh. What if the Premier should didn't come back? But I want Barcelona and Lionel Messi to redeem themselves from last season. So let's just do the Champions League in August and sort that out, and eh, let's just carry on afterwards. I always forget you're a Barca fan. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a, so for people watching this, I'm a Blackburn Rovers fan, but Barcelona are my second team. And while Blackburn Rovers are going through this long phase of not being a good team, um, then Barcelona have kind of risen in my, in my uh, preferences over that time. So I do have a massive soft spot for them. But for like since the 90s, not just since the last 10 years, for a long time. Yeah. Um, anyway, Adam, thank you for coming on. Thank you for being the first ever guest on this interview series. It's about legacy. And I'm spoken to you this week. I know that is something you actually care about. So talk to me, Adam. First question. When you pass on, hopefully it'll be a long time from now, what is it that you want to be remembered by? What do you want your legacy to be? Um, I think the, the the initial thought when someone asks you about your legacy is your work, isn't it? Mm. Like for most people, I think, well, my, my brain, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but my brain jumps to work when I think about legacy. But <clears throat> because I've thought about this a lot, I do also think about like family and whatever as well, personal life. But I'll deal with work first. <laughs> it's uh, especially, it, it, this is going to sound arrogant, but you no, know go, me. No, go on. I know you as well. So for those There's going to be people in the comments who don't. I want to be remembered go as on. one of the best stand-ups to ever come out of the UK. Okay, so one of the one of the greatest comedians that the UK has ever produced. Not just comedian, I'm specifically talking about stand-up. Right, so, okay. Like, I have this sort of issue. Whenever my agent sets up meetings with, like, London TV producers and that, and they're like, right, so what are you using stand-up for? I'm like, more stand-up. <laughs> yeah, and no one, thing can, in no one can really get he... their head around it. Yeah, because there's loads thing of people. Is... Go on. I was just going to say, there's a thing that because people think, oh, I want to use stand up to get into, t I want to get my sitcom on TV. Um, yeah. I want to become a comedy actor. I want to be on Mock the Week. I want to do all those panel shows and stuff. And eventually, maybe like Graham Norton present a show or something. But you're like proper, like, st like stand up is that's what you want to do. Like, if you could do nothing but stand up and make a really comfortable, super good living from that, like, you do nothing else. A hundred percent. So I'll do any TV show I'm offered. And I have fun doing them. I've done a few. I obviously did the Tez O'Clock show with you. Done a, f a couple of bits of stand-up on the stand-up sketch show. Did Roast Battle. And I enjoyed them all. They, they each came with different challenges and I like challenging myself and doing something that's outside my comfort zone. But I only do those things because I want to sell more stand-up tickets. Mm. Like, if someone said to me right now, you can, we'll give you a TV show you're on BBC One or Channel 4 or whatever, nine o'clock every Saturday night, but you can never do stand-up again. I'd tell them to go fuck themselves. Really? That's so interesting because I wouldn't. <laughs> 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 I'm like, someone, how many, like, I'm going to be wrong, I love stand-up. Like, if I could only do one or the other and they paid the same, I would do stand-up. But if someone put enough zeros at the end of that check and was like, listen, you can buy all the farmhouses you want in Lancashire. You can buy the whole of the Ribble Valley, but you just can't do stand up again. I'd be like, "All right, let's fucking let's let's do it then. Let's fucking be the new Graham Norton without the, without his uh, extra critical activities." See, I think like with something we're going to talk about a bit, like legacy of your family life and comfort and providing for your kids, your your partner and. Uh, even your grandkids and leaving something for everyone else. I do think about that as well. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it would be an easy decision if someone went, right, here's a hundred million for three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like how many like how many zeros would it become for you to be like, actually, 
Mm. It would have to be in that ballpark. Right, okay. Like like Joe Rogan like, like it, Joe Rogan's New Deal. Yeah, like if it was ten million, I'd say no. And I can say that very, very confidently. Wow. Ten million and but you can never do stand up again. T- ten million a year. Oh then uh, yeah, I'd think about it. Okay. Yeah, this, I just, I just, it's, it's I'd still think about it. It's man, not yes. That's mad. If someone said to me ten million a year, I'd be like that'd be like that's it. That's that's I've achieved the, <laughs> the goal. Well, I guess then I want to make a good show and make sure it lives on. But no, that's mad, man. That's but you're like I first remember meeting you at the Hot Water Comedy Club, which and Hot, In the Crown. Yes, and the Hot the Water. Pub. Yeah. So for you, for those of you that don't know, the Hot Water Comedy Club is one of the best clubs. Actually, it's probably in the top three best comedy clubs in the country, and it's been going about a third of the time of the rest of the big comedy clubs in the country. Very, yeah. very quickly, they cement their reputation for just being one of the best comedy clubs. They've got amazing rooms and amazing audiences, and they book just really killer comics, so every show is really good, and people want to come back. Uh, and part of their success is also down to their resident MC, Paul Smith, who I'm sure I'll get on this show at some point. Anyway... First time I met you was before Hot Water became what it is today. They had a show at the Crown Pub opposite Lamb Street Station. For people who are familiar yeah. with Liverpool, that pub on the corner. They used to have a room, they used to room upstairs and they did comedy every Sunday night, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. And I went to do the Sunday night show, which was for new acts and open mic comics. Just try and impress and see what happens. And that's when I met you, man. You were in the crowd. And I think, I remember I went, all right, I went on and I did all right. And... I came off and we didn't know each other, so we didn't know each other to say hi and stuff. But you just gave me a little look like like almost like <laughs> like like a like like a look of Yeah, alright. Hmm. Hmm. I like I like what you I'm not we're not friends right now, but I, I like what you we're did. Gonna be. Yeah, like like, like like you're you're a contender. Hmm. So I used to when I first started out, so I th- as far as I'm aware, Hot Water Comedy Club was in a nightclub called Envy for about a year. Maybe like eighteen months. Oh no, it was it was nearly two years. It was in there, and then there was a problem when the Euros or the World Cup was happening. It was one of the big international summer tournaments, mm. and basically the nightclub said to Hot Water, "We want to show every game of the tournament, so find another venue for six weeks, and then come back to us." And Hot Water went fuck off. Yeah, because if you've we'll met, just go the, and take all of our business with us. If you met the guys who own Hot Water, they don't, they're not, they don't piss around. <laughs> it's a fucking understatement, isn't it? <laughs> um, so they found the Crown where they'd done the odd midweek gig, um, but they hadn't tried any weekends there yet. Mm. And then they just stayed there for a few years until they got new management, and the new manager was like, "Oh, I'm not sure about this comedy thing." Um, it later turned out. I hope I'm allowed to say this, that the reason the new manager told the comedy club to fuck off is because he thought it was making no money, which is impossible because they were putting like 80 people in there three nights a week. Yeah, but now when quiet a, pub. It was a Sunday night and it was rammed. Oh, it was chocker every, every night they were on. It turned out the previous manager was just scraping all the comedy money off the top. So on, on paper, the, the the gig was like losing a hundred quid a week or something, because he was just like, no that one is, will know. I'm just that is amazing. He was just keeping the upstairs bar for himself. That is um, that is some proper Liverpool gangster shit, man. <laughs> that is so funny. But you, you, I hope I've got that right, and I haven't like dreamt it because I can't what? remember the last time. Fact check it. So when I put the audio out for this, <laughs> we, we, well, we I tell you what, if the audio goes liable. out for this. Tez is not liable. I am. Okay, Sue fine. me. I'll get a routine out of it. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, good. Um, so after that, they moved to the Holiday Inn. Yeah, which I did a few times. Yeah. But in those first few years, like, I had a few part-time jobs working behind bars and stuff. And whenever I was off and there was a gig on, I'd just go. It Like, it wasn't like... What should I do tonight? If, if if there was comedy on and I wasn't working and I wasn't like playing fussy with my friends or something, mm. I'd just go. I'd never just sit in the house. When did you so when, did, when did you when did you start? Two thousand and ten. What month? June. Sunday the twenty seventh of June, two thousand and ten. I am eleven days older than you. <laughs> the sixteenth. Yeah, my comedy birthday is in like two three weeks, and then yeah, yours in same. four weeks, five four and a half weeks. This will be the first year. That I haven't done a gig on my gig anniversary. Yeah, yeah, same. 
I do it every year, unless some miracle happens and in four weeks we're all allowed to gig again, but I don't see that. Um, but I, I just used to go. A combination of things was, first of all, I loved just being around it. Hmm. Secondly, I'd go and try and learn because I was watching like comics who were much more experienced and better than me and being like, what are they doing that I'm not? Mm. What What's giving them the extra laugh? What, what Where are they getting it from? What I was, because I became quickly obsessed. I've always been like that. If I'm good at something, I become obsessed with it. If I'm not good at something, I never do it again. I've played Call of Duty once <laughs> in my life. I've played Grand Theft Auto online once in my life. I've had every FIFA since FIFA World Cup 1998 because I'm good at FIFA and I'm shit at every other video game. So I played them once and go, I'm not get, I'm not going to spend the time getting better at it. So I'm never playing it again. Whereas comedy was something I was good at. So I was like, right, I'll throw everything into it. So did your first game go well? Yeah. Or like, rel- like relatively, of course. Relatively is the word, yeah. Like, I, I've got a recording of it. I recorded it. Um, yeah, I've got a recording of my first gig that I'm going to put out on my comedy birthday because I don't think many people have seen it. And like, looking back now, it's cringe. But like, on the day, it went well. Like, there were good laughs in the audience for enough for me to think, huh, I, could, I should do this again. Mine was horrific. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, like... It's it's embarrassingly a shit and b offensive. Now, anyone who's in the comments or watching this that knows my stand up will think he doesn't give a shit when he offends people. He says whatever the fuck he wants, mm. but that's not true. I always try and weird jokes that I write so that I'm on the right side of the line, but I am pushing it. The ones I had were horrendously bad, ill thought out, stereotype bullshit. Like one of them was. Um, I'm going to find this really funny, but go on. Because I love, I love offensive jokes, but go on. <laughs> it was something like, uh, I'm at that age now where all my friends have got girlfriends. The only bird I've got just sits in its cage all day making fucking noises. She calls it the kitchen, but whatever. <laughs> oh <was> like, <laughs> my God. Like, it was that level of shit. But what you've got to understand is, so bad. is that I grew up on a council estate in Liverpool. There's no diversity there. It's just everyone there looks, sounds, and acts like me and my dad. Everyone's the same. And an offensive joke like that is commonplace. You get texted from your stupid uncle every now and then. Mm. And I was 18 years old. I'd not been to university. I'd not experienced any of life. I, I came into it with these stupid ideas of what was acceptable and what wasn't. And you're just saying it because it's funny and whatever. And it doesn't matter what you say and we're all just having a laugh. Because no one on a council estate really gets offended by a joke. Because you've got more important things to worry about, like paying your fucking bills. Being upset at comedy is a middle class privilege. <laughs> it, it is. It is. Like, this is a weird thing for me, though. Like, having... Because comedy, like, we are the cutting edge of, like, liberal discourse. Like, whatever new thing is coming out comedians are the one of the first people to adopt it or we're at least aware of the conversation because it's happening around us or it, it's it, people are talking about what you can and can't say in comedy clubs and stuff so like sometimes when there's certain jokes like that one about the kitchen stuff that we wince at now a because like it's not the best joke you've ever written but also because of the content as well like there are people who would make those jokes like if someone if you're if you're the builders in or something like they might make that joke and you'd be like oh i don't know about that but they don't say anything wrong with it and it's so weird that Sometimes I pull my mates up about certain things they say, and they're like, "But you're a comedian, mate. Why do you care?" Yeah, yeah. And it's totally, so weird. Like, I what what I can't stand is a comedian who goes after other comedians for being a comedian. Yes, <laughs> like, yes, I know what you mean. Like, comedians should be back at each other to make jokes about bad, bad stuff and making it funny. The new Doug Stanhope special that came out last week, which I think he's charging like $8 for or something. Doug Stanhope is not a household name, certainly not in the UK, but very revered amongst comedians and especially in America. The little teaser clip he put out was so brilliant. I don't know whether you've seen it, but he was like, um, how can the term make fun ever be a bad thing? Like, you shouldn't make fun. What? You should never make f- make 
fun. How can you put those two words together and it be a negative thing? Did I take some nasty, horrible, possibly unavoidable shit from the world and I made it fun? What a dick I must be. <laughs> and that was his little teaser clip for his new right, special. Right, right. And there's there's another comic, I won't name him because it's not fair to, but we we to an untrained eye, we share very similar philosophies on comedy which is, I'll say something if I think it's funny. I don't really care if it's right. I'll just say it, which is almost exactly what I believe. What I'll say, I'll say anything on stage I feel like I can defend. Mm. Whereas that joke, the kitchen one, I don't know how I can defend it. Yeah. So I would never say that now. You, because... you see a lot of new comics making those types of jokes because they just don't know any better. And yeah. they haven't got the skills or like the time, they haven't invested the time to write better jokes, create proper craft, because it's a craft, to craft proper material. So the first few things that pop into their heads are like, oh, I'll say this because my mates in the pub would laugh at it. But then when you're in front of an audience of 100 plus people, it becomes a very different thing. It really does. And the like... <laughs> I also think like comedians who are like, oh, I'll say whatever I want. And uh, if people don't like it, they just fuck them. It's like, well, our whole MO is to please the people in front of us. So if I tell a joke and 90 people out of 100 go, that was fucking horrendous. We hated that. Then that's a bad joke. Mm -hmm. But if I tell a joke and 300 people laugh, but one person is like, that's horrendous. You should never joke about 9-11. You should never joke about 9-11 because it's just the one thing that I care about. Then fuck that person because I've got the majority of the room and comedians should be judged in the room mm. as well. I hate it when a comedian puts a clip out and they're at a mainstream comedy club. They're not at a fucking BNP rally or <laughs> some, And they do a joke and they're at a comedy club in the West End of London and 400 people laugh and then they put the clip out and people are going, I can't believe people are laughing at this. There should have been outrage. It's like, th th it's in front of the most liberal people in the world. They're in the West End of the fucking capital of the UK. You daft cunts. You weren't there. You can't possibly get the context from it or you wouldn't be saying that. I said, like context is king. For me, my, my philosophy in comedy is simple. Someone wrote in the comments, I just saw it then. Oh, Tez, wouldn't you be offended by Muslim jokes? And it's not about what offends me. I find stuff, I still find stuff I'm offended by funny. Yeah. Like, like the Book of Mormon is one of the best things, full stop, not just musicals, it's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. But as a person who believes in a God, the God, there were bits in that show that were horrifically offensive. Yeah. But nevertheless... It was still a funny show. And so I'd say it objectively. And my philosophy in comedy is always this. If you can say the thing that you want to say in front of the people you're talking about, then go ahead. Exactly. That's my philosophy. That's exa like, exactly. So I wrote a joke just before lockdown that I stopped doing because of that. That's exactly my attitude. What you've just said. Mm. You've just put it in better words than I did. I wrote a joke that had the word midges in it. Right. And Jade's seen it. Jade's my missus for anyone listening. And she was like, you need to change that joke because it's only funny because you're saying the word midges is funny and that midgets are funny. Would you say that joke if there was a small person on the front row? And I had to say no. So I've, I, I won't do that joke anymore. I've stopped it. I stopped yeah. it before lockdown. However, I, I do you remember I sent you a joke which has now become a proper routine because it was off the cuff. That was so funny. Go on, tell the story. The, the Islamophobia bit. So I I wrote a bit about how essentially the crux of the joke is there'd be less Islamophobia if Muslims just had a drink every now and then. Mm. Which, if a politician ever said that, I would be hounding him. Because he's a politician and that would be an awful thing for someone to say and mean. Mm. I'm saying it because it's so ridiculous that it's funny to say. And I said it off the cuff for the first time and then eventually I sent it to you and then reframed the joke about having a Muslim friend and talking to him and saying, um, why, why do you think the country is Islamophobic? Oh, 
it's because of the way the media portrays us after all the attacks. And I'm like, yeah, but don't you think you could help yourself out if you didn't drink? Of course, that's not a, an okay thing to say, but yeah. it's a funny thing to say. And that's why I said it. And I sent it to you because I was like, before I put this out, you're my mate. And I would trust your judgment before anyone else is on this issue. Before anyone else I know, I know you're a, uh, uh, a good mate of mine, a good comic, a Muslim, an observant Muslim as well. And you'll yeah, tell I'm me... Not, I'm not Ishan fucking Akbar. Yeah, not that <laughs> rat. He's probably watching. <laughs> he is, he is, I said it because he is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ishan. Go on. Sorry, Adam. He's going to go and put a fucking Coldplay album on now, you know. He's not going <laughs> to listen to this shit anymore. <laughs> oh, um, man. But yeah, I, I, I sent it to you because I was like, if, like it worked in the room and I'll, I've, like I said, I've since reworked it into a proper routine. It's actually on the special that I'm putting out at the weekend. Yeah, let's talk about that and, in a minute. But I sent it to you to be like, because I thought if, if Tez thinks this is out of order, then I'll rethink it. Because mm. I do care what people think. What I don't care is what, Middle class white women with blue hair think about anything. <laughs> well, except maybe hair dye. But apart from yeah, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you if I do a joke about hair dye, you can get upset. If I do a joke about I don't know the tension in the Middle East, I'm not going to listen to you from Surrey. <laughs> but this, this Elizabeth, my, I I realized <laughs> this is a thing that I realized quite early on uh, in comedy because there was a guy who this is like right on the open mic scene, probably like 2010, like back then. And he had this funny joke. It was a white guy. And he had a funny joke about um, call centers in India. And he was really good at mimicking accents. And he did like a really good Indian call center accent. And he always got a good laugh in the room. And then we run one night. And you know, comics repeat their material a lot for people who don't watch comedy. So he didn't do the bit. And I was like, oh, why didn't you do that bit? It's really funny. And he went, oh, yeah, yeah. But then I noticed there was like four Indian girls in the front row. So I thought I won't do it. And then I thought about and this. I'd never thought about it before. Other than, but then I thought... But well, then you shouldn't be doing it. If you exactly. can't, if you can't do it in front of them, and they would have found it funny, I know they would have. But then you shouldn't be doing the bit. And, and the similar thing about a lot of people at the time, like using the word "jippo" on stage, um, uh, which, which is which is not a nice word for for the traveller community. And and I thought to myself, you would never ever use that word if there were an audience of travellers in. You just fucking wouldn't. No. So why are you saying that word then? Like, this thing, like, as a Muslim, there are things that offend me and there are certain lines that I have. But I also accept that comics will say certain things that I don't agree with. And if the audience, and ultimately the audience are the judge, because the audiences don't let comics get away with overtly racist, homophobic, Islamophobic material, because the audiences are the first to sh shut them down. Anytime I've ever had an overtly racist or Islamophobic heckle, the audience have turned on that person way before I can say anything. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the only reason I would ever go, and I pr would probably never do this, to be honest with you, with 99% of the jokes I've ever had, the only reason I would ever go, there, there, I can't do this bit, Yeah, is because I would be worried that the audience get offended on their behalf. That's the only, because yeah, yeah, yeah. like at a late show, which I think a lot of people think late shows tend to be more, you can say whatever you want. It's absolutely not true. It's the total opposite. The more drunk people get, the less they're listening, the easy they are to offend. If, because they get triggered could, by buzz. They'll hear a word and they get triggered straight away and they won't listen to the rest of the joke. It happened to me last year. This is, I'll tell you this story. This is funny. At Late and Live in Edinburgh, right? So we'd been drinking. It was the night of the Dave party as well. Oh, yeah. Which so for those... Explain what Late and Live is for people watching. Okay, I'll explain both. So the Dave party is like one of the biggest parties that is invite only for comedians at the Edinburgh Fringe. It's a free bar. So it was the night of that. We'd had a few drinks. Um... And then Late and Live is a gig that starts at 3 a.m. Um, or does it start at 1 a.m. and runs until 3? Yeah, it starts at 1 and it finishes at 4. Okay. You right. might have so, been on at 3, though. I think maybe I was. So I was definitely in, like, the, the latter half of the show. Oh. Um. Yep, sorry, we've got you back. Yep. 
Um, so <laughs> <laughs> we're all having a few drinks, and I said to I was with Eshan, oh yeah, Thomas Green, um, and Ed Hedges, and I said to them all, right, all give me a word, and if I get it in, you buy me a drink. And if I don't get it into me set, I'll buy you one. So Ed gave me like platypus. Thomas Green gave me, I don't know, hot dog. Eshan gave me Pakistani and not the Stani bit. Right? <laughs> he's, he's such a dickhead. And he went, not only do you, can you say it, but he pulled a, he pulled a load of money out of his pocket. And I think he had 200 quid. And he said, so if you get it in, I'll buy you a drink. That bet's safe. But if you walk on stage and go, any Englishman in? <laughs> any Scotsman in? <laughs> and then any Pakistanis in? Then he would have given me the 200 quid. And I swear to God, if I'd have had two more drinks in me, I'd have probably done it for the sake of 200 quid. <laughs> you know what, though? I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a weird thing with that word because... There's a part of me that wouldn't be offended if you said that, don't, but I wouldn't be offended if you said that word because, like, Scousers, you are the packies of white people. <laughs> no, look, you've got, you've got your own language, you stick to your own, you date within your own community, and, and, and the media hates you, and, and, and the rest of the country always does a pop at you. So you are, you are the white, the, the packies of white people. You guys and the Irish who are called the Pakistanis. But you, you, you guys are, that, that's what I'm like. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Look at the lens of this, but I mean. So bloody hell, man. Yeah, look at this, like. <sighs> um, but I didn't do it. But what I did do that night is a routine that I'll talk about in a second in a bit more detail. Um, I've got this routine that I think you've seen about last year, Victoria's Secret's CEO. This is such a good bit. Said, said that they'll never have a fat or a transgender model. Now, I'm not going to ruin the routine because it's on, again, the special. And anyone watching, I've got a special coming out on Saturday on my YouTube channel. If you go to my profile, you'll find all the details. Um, <laughs> but I was on stage and I'd had a few drinks I wasn't drunk but I'd had a few drinks and <laughs> there's this girl on the front row classic blue hair like not enjoying herself deliberately and I I went um, something about fat people and she went define fat <laughs> right and I didn't even take a breath I went me and above, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's and such a good, like, like bar. It, to it be stopped her in her tracks. And the funniest thing was, no one in the audience laughed, but Marlon Davis, who was watching the show on the wings, and you know, if you don't know Marlon Davis, Marlon Davis has got the most distinctive laugh, more distinctive than Jimmy Carr. Marlon's it, laugh is so infectiously hilarious. He died laughing, and then the room laughed at him laughing. <laughs> it's such a great way of just show. There are certain like, like I love a good heckle come. I, I hate heckles, but I love a good heckle comeback. And the pithier they are, just the better they are. And just you saying me and above three words is so fucking funny. I fucking love that just me and above and like there's nothing else that, that's, that's an ace in it that's like a fucking fed but you can't come, like you're like oh the ball's gone past me that but I can't, I can't <laughs> swing was, in the mist like I've missed that I seen her face in real time go from I'm the smuggest person in the world to define fat to oh I, actually <laughs> <laughs> okay then and I like that that's my favourite routine that I've ever had and it's been difficult for me to now put it out online because I'll never do it again once it's online. Mm. Um, and the reason I like it so much is it's, I talk about transgender people and fat people in that routine. And <laughs> it's, 
very, very, very fat phobic. And it's not transphobic at all. And it's written with such precision to be that way. Because when when you're going to talk about those two things, they're both contentious subjects for the people in those groups. But the trans one is a buzzword for other people. Mm. So when you start it, you have people going, he's going to talk about this trans. And all they're focusing on is me. Tra- they're tra- people who want to get offended are going, he's going to be transphobic in a minute and I'm going to fucking catch him. And while they're doing that, they miss all the horrendous fat shit. <laughs> So, <laughs> the so your trans bit is a shield, which isn't yeah. which isn't that offensive, but triggering is a shield for all the fat shit that you're saying. Yeah, That's and it's written that way on papers. So and also, I can't. I I've got to put that routine out now because I'm dieting and trying to lose a bit of weight. And while I'm fat, that routine is fine because you can't have a go at me for doing fat shaming routine while I'm literally obese according to that chart that you can get on Google. Oh my God. Could without you put, also going could you and make, having a go at Chris Rock for his black people versus thingy routine because it's the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's friendly fire. <laughs> if, I, just, I just thought of something for you, um, Adam. If you have to stay fat in order to keep some of your material relevant, could junk food not then become tax deductible? Isn't it already? <laughs> not when you're in your house. <laughs> I'm oh. sure there's some accountants here who could verify that. Um, so listen, your legacy is you want to be one of the great... You want to be remembered for being one of the greatest um, stand-ups from the UK ever. I'm guessing in the same breath as like Billy Connolly, Lee Evans, like Peter Kay, like that. You want your name to be... up. You want your name to be in the same sentence when people bring up those names. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think I'm going to get there. Mm. But I feel like if I aim for it, then where I end up can't be that bad. Yeah, I always say shoot for the stars and you might land on the moon. I seen a post on Instagram that said, shoot for the moon (laughs) and if you miss... You might land amongst the stars. And <laughs> that's you know become what, my philosophy. You know, you know why that makes no sense? It's because the moon is significantly closer than the stars. <laughs> <laughs> that's like saying, um, try running down your street. Because if you don't manage that, you might run a marathon. It doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> Like, like it should be, it should be the other way around. Like, shoot for the stars, and if you don't get there, you might get to the moon because it's on the fucking <laughs> way. <laughs> you can't, it's, it's, oh, it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? My, my sister, bless her. I don't know if she's watching this, but my sister, my older sister, has just she just got into Instagram about six months ago, and she's at the sharing tacky quotes stage of her Instagram and I just I pull her on it pull her up, up on it all the time. I'm like anyone could make up anything and just put a picture of a mountain on it and you'd be like fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had a routine for a bit about um people who believe anything as long as they write it on a sunset. That was one of my bits. And then it was uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told one of my mates I was trying to lose weight and they sent me a a picture of a man halfway up a mountain and it said, I don't stop when I'm tired. I stop when I'm done. And I couldn't relate to that because the only time I feel that way is when I'm at the carvery. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. So listen, that's that's stand-up and I get it. You, you, you want to reach for the stars, but you might land on the moon, which in itself would be an amazing achievement. But I, I get it. But what about, in, so what about non-stand-up? What's the legacy you want to leave behind non-stand-up? Um, I want my family, and I include Jade, 
children, me dad, me brother, I want them to be proud of me and mm. not just say it, but be like happy that they are. Oh, who's my dad? My dad's Adam Rowe, mate. My dad's that comedian guy. Who's my husband? Adam Rowe, mate. That's just what you want, isn't it? You want them to be happy. And yeah, I think that's the answer is just have them be happy to be associated with your name. <laughs> so where are you at if you died tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to be gone tomorrow. I think the dog had missed me. <laughs> yeah. Dogs, dogs do that. It's in the job description. Um, do you know what I'm quite worried about if I died tomorrow? I might be remembered as that guy Mackies didn't let in. <laughs> Oh man! All right, you're gonna have to tell this story for the people who are not familiar with it. Why are I you will do. Mackie's nemesis? So it's quite weird, this, and I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I only really mentioned it once on my podcast. Um, if anyone wants a podcast, by the way, have a word. I do a podcast called Have a Word three times a week. One of them's behind a paywall. Two of them are public with another comedian. Um, called Dad Nightingale. And I addressed this once and I've ignored everything since. And if someone tweets me about this, I mute them immediately. <laughs> and the reason for it, I look, I laugh about it a lot, is it fucking battered my mental health for about a week. Really? Because, right, so I'll tell people the story. What happened was I, I went to Glasgow in uh, January in my Ford Fiesta 1.5 litre five door blue Ford Fiesta 65 plate. And I went to Glasgow to open for an American comic called Theo Vaughn. Um, but he also had a feature act with him. So over here, like some comics will take tour support. Like I've done a little bit for you and it'll be the tour support break and then the main act most of the time. Americans tend to have a local opener and then a feature act who does the whole tour with them. Right. So we had that. So I wasn't getting paid a lot of money. It was a big venue, but I think I was getting a hundred dollars, which is about eighty-six quid. Mm. But because it was Theo Von, who's a dead good comic, and I've got sort of designs on going to America long term. I like making these connections. I've opened for another a, a couple of other Americans in the past, which is partly why I got the job. Um and I was like, I don't care about the money, I want to go and do it. Went and did the gig. On the way back. I was in a quite a serious car crash. So I was coming down the M6 and it was through like the Pennine, not the Pennine, the Lake District region where you go quite high at one point. And it went from being a fairly mild night to blizzard level snow. Like that, like and straight away. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it coming back from Yorkshire. Coming back from Leeds to Blackburn, going on the M62, I've seen it, how much it fucking switches. And in, when you're high up in those hills, man, it comes down fast, quick. And before you know it, you can't see anything. So what happened was, because it happened so quick, I was behind a truck in the left lane. And I moved into the middle lane to overtake him. So I'm, I'm accelerating now towards 70. And... Then the snow hit. And before I had a chance to go, fucking hell, it's snow and I should slow down. The car literally spun, went just behind the truck. Like, if I'd have got closer to overtaking him, I'd have gone under it. Shit. It spun. It hit, you know, like the little, sort of like this bit on the side of the motorways, yep, yep, like yep, the little yep. fence bit. Yeah. It hit that, spun over, the, like flipped over the side, landed. And just did that, and I was like, and it happened so quick, genuinely. And I, I was eventually going to do stand up about this. I probably never will now. My genuine thought was, while it happened, was for fuck's sake. That was it. It wasn't. I'm going to die. It wasn't. Oh my god. Oh my god. I just went. Oh, fuck. Did you did you land upside down or we look on your? No, I landed the right way. Now, the car didn't look as bad as the crash was. Right? But, so I was in my car. The first person I rang before I rang for any help was Jade. 
And I was like, look, this has happened. I'm about an hour and 20 minutes from home. I might need you to come and get me. And she's like, okay, cool. She got straight in the car. She didn't end up coming to get me um, because she was so tired and it was snowing and I didn't want to drive and tired. Mm. Um, whatever. But I rang her. Then I rang me insurance and whatever. And the police come and got me. And then <coughs> initially I felt okay. And the police are asking me questions and whatever. They breathalyzed me. hadn't had any alcohol. Um, and then the police go, right, how are you getting home? I was like, well, I don't really know. I'm tempted to uh, see if a taxi will come and get me. And he's like, oh, well, what we're going to do is, it, the taxi was hundreds of pounds to come and get me or whatever. So they were like, what we're going to have to do, mate, is drop you at the train station. Um, in where was it? Penrith. I think it was Penrith. Well, it's a train station. Yes, a place up there. Um, and they went, "We'll just drop you there. There's a McDonald's next door. Mm. Just go and sit in there until your first train. We've just checked the first train back to Liverpool's in like two hours or whatever it was. And I got there. They dropped me off and drove off immediately. And then I just started panicking a bit. You know, you just like a mm. delayed bit of shock, panic attack, and I, starts, I have panic starts, attacks starts, every now and then. Every starts hitting you. Um, I have panic attacks fairly regularly, anyway, with like health anxiety and stuff. But I was just, it just spun me a bit, and then I got to the door of the McDonald's and it was shut. So I walked down to the drive-through, and there's a woman working there, and I went, "Excuse me, love." Um, and I was holding my laptop, which had took out the boot of my car, and my notebook, which was a refurbished Lion King book, <laughs> a cartoon Lion King homemade notebook, and a laptop. And I went, excuse me, love, um, what time do you open? And she went, like, in 27 minutes, or whatever it was. And I went, look, I don't know whether you've just noticed, but the, the police have dropped me off. I've been in quite a bad car crash. I don't mind not buying anything or buying something when I when it when your tills are open or whatever. But it's absolutely pissing down with rain. I'm in quite a bad way. Yeah, the the train's not for another whatever. Could you come in? Could I just come in and sit down and get out the rain? And she goes, "I told you, we don't open for another twenty seven minutes. There's nothing I can do." So. I was like, oh, right, okay, cool. So I just stood under the bit of shelter, but still getting rained on because it's sideways rain up there. In a <laughs> outside this McDonald's, and because you're in that mood and you're so pissed off, you've just been in a car crash. You've been left to wait for a two-hour train in the rain, in the freezing fucking cold. It's snowing five miles up the road. I just, I took a selfie and I put it on um, Twitter and said, the manager of Pine Ref McDonald's can go fuck herself. I remember this. Um, I've been in a horrendous car crash. She won't even let me in for a minute to get out the cold. And then there was a troll who had Colin Kaepernick as his uh, profile picture, who was just being a cunt, as trolls tend to be. Like, what the fuck, lad? <laughs> Um, what gives you the right to uh, be slagging off managers of McDonald's? So I found, because I had nothing else to do, I found his Facebook profile, the <laughs> troll. And I took screenshots of it, posted it on Twitter, and said, this guy's a bully. Scouse Twitter, do you think? Oh, man. Now, Scouse Twitter is known for if someone's being a horrible cunt, they'll send shit to your house. So an example of this is a few years ago, there was a, a fella in uh, a pub beer garden, I believe in Cheltenham, on the back of a T-shirt he had printed himself. Uh, Hillsborough was God's own form of rent -o kill I remember this. And he got fired from his job because they Scouse Twitter found out where he worked they sent, like, bouncy castles, priests to perform an exorcism, 
uh, about 600 quid's <laughs> worth of lilt to his house. <laughs> a priest they just, to perform an exorcism. Fucking they hell. sent skips, like huge skips to his house that he had to pay for. Um, just real, like really took this guy to town for being a horrible cunt. And basically, I felt like... I was being bullied for being in a car crash by this guy, and I was like, Scouts Twitter, sort this out. But that was a fucking d- ridiculous frame of mind to be in. Mm. You had literally just survived a car crash, like, and now you've been left on your own in the cold. I get it, man. That's, you know, you're not going to do... And <clears throat> so I then just didn't go on my phone for a bit because I'm just sort of trying to focus myself. By the time I'd woke up, so I'd got the train home, I hadn't been checking my social media come in, went to bed for a few hours and woke up about, I don't know, one or two in the afternoon. And I had messages from a lot of friends, a lot of comics colleagues, a lot of them saying, you know, seeing you in a car crash, hope you're okay, let us know if you can do anything. People generally being nice. And then I checked like Twitter and I was the villain of Twitter. So I was like, what the fuck? I mean, like one of my best mates I was talking to him and he was like, people have really taken it the wrong way. It's because it's six of them. They've woke up. They're pissed off with their family. The kids aren't listening to them. They go to Twitter. And it looks like you're just whinging. Mm. They don't really know what's gone on. They're just seeing screen grabs and little snippets of stuff. So I deleted me two posts. I was like, look, people have took the thing the wrong way. And I'm really sorry about that. But the manager of Penrith McDonald's can still suck me fucking dick. <laughs> and then... Scouse energy. <laughs> Scouse energy, man. I fucking love it. And then it just carried on and on and on for about a week. But the the story, and what I've just told you, by the way, is although it would seem that I've got my side of the story and it would be a bias, as far as I'm concerned, I've just told you an objective version of that story. I asked to come in out the cold. I was told not to. So I posted a bit of a whiny selfie, right? The story became especially after I deleted the thing because, and it made me realize on a very small scale how quick bullshit spreads. Mm. The story became Adam Rowe bullied a 16-year-old girl who was on her own working in McDonald's at five o'clock in the morning because she wouldn't give him an Egg McMuffin (laughs) 15 minutes before it opened. And you can see how, why, if that's the version of the story, you're the villain in it. But that's not what happened. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. So what I started doing was just ignoring anything that came with that storyline. And I was like, look, if that's what people think, then me denying that is just not going to... They're not going to go, mm. oh, we've got it wrong. Cool. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because- Certainly not publicly. So there was a there's a lad who follows me and I follow him and he's sort of a known scouse account. He's not got a huge amount of followers, but people know who he is. And he put something along those lines, really shitty. And I was just in a fucking bad mood one day. So I DM'd him. And normally I'd be like, listen, you fucking bell end. You better open ever bump. But I didn't do that. I thought, you know what? Take the exact opposite approach. And I told him exactly what I've told you in a massive fucking essay. I was like, listen, lad, Here's what's happened. Here's what people think's happened. And I swear to God, you've got this wrong. I know you follow a lot of these people. Go and ask them whether they think I'm the type of person that you think I am. I swear to God, you've got this wrong. And he messaged me back and said, I'm really sorry I've got this wrong, lad. Oh. Uh, I apologise. And he deleted all his tweets. And then there was people replying to him going, why have you deleted that tweet about Adam Rowe? And he was going, it turns out I got it wrong. Happy to admit when I'm wrong. And that's all it takes sometimes is going, like, getting to know, sending someone a DM is different to replying to one of their tweets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting yeah, personal yeah. and going, this is actually what happened. Because also you completely and take their ego out of it as well. Because because you've made it private, they're not suddenly going, well, I've got an audience to play up to here. They've just gone, all right, let's have a, let's have a genuine one-to-one conversation. Yeah. But, like, every, like, every time I now tweet an opinion about something, certainly if I'm having a go at someone, it comes up. Yeah, yeah. I've, seen, like, I've, 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 a, I've, seen, I've seen it. I've seen it just randomly pop up into stuff. I'm a notorious troll for like football as well. 
Like, I like winding other football fans up. I think it's part of footy. I don't hate any other fan base. But, like, I like winding Everton up. The other day, I'll send you the screenshot of this after we're done. Go this on. is the God's honest truth. So, someone put, an Everton fan put, they're champions of the world. They're about to win the Premier League. The champions of Europe. But still, all they want to talk about every now and then is Everton. And what he's saying is, Liverpool might be this massive club, but they still talk about us. We're Everton, aren't we? Mm. So I put, <laughs> yeah, but if you were like a really successful lawyer and a chess grandmaster, you'd still check in on your aid-ridden <laughs> older brother every now and then, wouldn't you? You guys, <laughs> right? you guys are relentless to Everton, you know, like, it's just like, there's no, like, it's unnecessary. You're like, you're better than them. You beat them every single year in the premiership twice, mostly. And you're like, just fucking give, just fucking give them a break, man. Um, <laughs> and I sent the tweet to me best mate and I said how many minutes do you think it will be until someone with an Everton player as their profile picture replies any luck getting into Mackey's yet lad or something along those lines mm. and it took about 10 <laughs> now I just want to say because I think we'll get cut off in a minute maybe 5 minutes or whatever um, you get cut off after yeah, an hour or something minutes, but, yeah so Thank you for that story. Uh, I'm glad... I just want to say go this. On, say, go on. The, fun, the funny replies to it. Like, someone sent me a video clip of Max and Paddy's Road to Nowhere, which was someone tapping on the door of a drive through and going, come here. And the woman goes, we're closed. <laughs> and he pulls a gun out and goes, no, you're not. Get that fucking cooker on. I cried laughing and you can if you when next time you see jade ask it i was tears in my eyes laughing at that all the funny replies to it i took i i made myself look like a whiny little bitch that morning yeah, yeah, yeah. but i wasn't bullying some 16 year old i was confronted by a 50 odd year old fat cunt <laughs> and i hope she's fucking on this i assume like she probably doesn't follow either of us um mate thank you so much for that story I, you know what it, it felt like it felt good for you to get that off your chest Oh, absolutely. Um, we've got two minutes remaining. So I want to say thank you so much. Adam Rowe, that has been uh, your legacy story. Hopefully, your legacy will be that whenever you pass on, hopefully, years and years and years and years, decades from now, you'll be remembered as one of the greats of British stand-up comedy and your name will be mentioned in the first sentences of the greats. Um, yes, and what can what, where can the people... So obviously, all of my followers, please follow Adam Rowe Comedy. What have you got coming up? What do you want to plug? Um, so first of all, my tw my Twitter's Adam Rowe Comedy. My Instagram is Adam Rowe Comedian. Adam Rowe Comedian. Thi this Saturday, I'm releasing a stand-up special on YouTube called Club Comic. Uh, YouTube.com slash Adam Rowe Comedy. Just please go and watch it. And if you enjoy it, tell someone about it. And if you don't enjoy it, just fucking keep that to yourself. If you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Adam Rowe, you're a very good friend of mine. Thank you so much for being on the Tesla Clock Show. Thank you so much for being you. Um, if you don't follow Adam Rowe, comedian, please do that. Please go watch his stand-up special because I swear to you, Adam Rowe is one of the finest comics working in this country and he'll be remembered, inshallah, as one of the finest comics this country's ever produced. So go watch Adam Rowe um, on YouTube and when he releases a special on Saturday, go watch it, give it a thumbs up and he's got a link Go on that link and give him some money for it as well because he's an absolute legend. Adam Rowe, thank you for joining us and thank you for telling me what you'd like your legacy to be. Top man. Thanks for having us, lad. I really appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, buddy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was so much fun. I mean, Adam's story about nearly dying was like deep. But what a fun guy. Like, go watch Adam's special. It's on his YouTube channel, uh, YouTube slash Adam Rowe Comedy. Club Comic is the name of his special. So go find it. Go like it. Leave a positive comment. And just go follow him on all his channels, innit? Adam Rowe is going to be an absolute star. Anyway, I've been Tez Elias. This is my YouTube series, Legacy. Tune in next week for another episode where we've got another brilliant guest. And we chop it and have really interesting conversations. Like, subscribe, leave a comment. Who would you like to see me interview in the future? And watch my special, Testify, on my channel right now. Peace, Tez Elias, signing out. Bye.